This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated on Talk Radio 860 WGUL. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Well, good evening, Tampa Bay, and welcome to your source for all the news about worms and germs. This is Outbreak News This Week, and I am your host, Robert Harriman. I've got a jam-packed show today, so let's dive right into it. According to the Centers for Disease Control, since May 1993, when hantavirus was, quote, discovered uh, during uh, an outbreak of an unexplained pulmonary il- illness, that occurred in the Four Corners area of the Southwest, there has been 639 cases reported nationally. The state that has seen the most cases is New Mexico, which has seen 100 laboratory confirmed hantavirus pulmonary syndrome cases, and uh, 42% of them died since 1993. Joining me on the phone to talk about hantavirus is the state public health veterinarian for the New Mexico Department of Health, Dr. Paul Edestad. Good evening, Dr. Edestad, and thanks for joining me today. Sure, you're welcome. Um, You are no stranger to hantavirus, seeing multiple cases annually. This year, you've seen six cases, half of them resulting in death. Let's go ahead and start with the basics for my audience. Um, What is hantavirus? How does someone contract this serious virus? And what is the type of disease or pathology that would be seen in people? Sure. So, hantaviruses are they're a group of viruses that are carried by uh, various different rodents. Um, there are many different types of species of hantavirus, and each different one is carried by a different species of rodent. Here in the Western United States, the most common one is what we call Sinombre virus. That was the name it was given, and it's most commonly carried by the, the deer mouse. Uh, the scientific name for that is Paramiscus maniculatus, but it's, it's the deer mouse and it's the typical uh, field mouse. And they live just fine with this virus inside their body, and they excrete it in their saliva and in their urine and in their droppings. And um, when those droppings, if they're fresh droppings and they are aerosolized into the air and people breathe them in, that's typically how people will come down with uh, and be infected with hantavirus. Uh, the incubation period, which is the time from when you're exposed to when you start to have illness, can vary from one to five weeks. It usually typically is around two to three weeks, though. So. Um, in terms of signs and symptoms that people have, it, it usually presents uh, typically in a very nonspecific way with a really short uh, three to five day period of fever and flu-like symptoms such as muscle aches, headaches, chills, dizziness, and could have some GI symptoms too, like nausea and vomiting. Um, unfortunately, after the, those uh, symptoms, what we call the prodrome, that lasts for three to five days, then the virus typically attacks some of the, uh, the cells in the blood vessels in the lungs called the endothelial cells, and that allows the fluid from the blood vessels in the lungs to leak into the lungs, and so people start to have a fluid buildup in their lungs, and they start to have a lot of difficulty breathing. And that's usually typically when they, they present for, uh, for medical care is at that time when they start to have a lot of difficulty breathing. Yeah, and it's a pretty significant pathogen with a case fatality rate in the high 30s. Correct. Yeah. Unfortunately, and it is the people in their, who are the, um, say, the most healthy, who have the strongest immune systems, people in their 20s and 30s, who seem to be at the most risk for having the most severe mm-hmm. illness, because this virus kind of allows the, the own, your own immune system to attack your own cells. It kind of causes that to happen, right. and that allows the leaking. So you have these really devastating cases of, of death in, in, your, in your young 20- and 30-year-old population. Now, Dr. Adestad, as I said in the intro, hantavirus was, quote, discovered in the U.S. in 1993. However, hantaviruses have been around for a long time in different areas of the world. Can you go into a little bit about the history of of where it may have came from to get into the United States and and so forth? Well, you know, if you get into that, you start to get into the really, you know, ecology of uh, 
of uh, movement patterns and such, and and uh, and uh, a lot of people believe you know this might have come across the the Bering Land Strait, you know, with right. with people and humans and rodents moving all together. Because you look at these Honda viruses, and like you said, there are some that are over in China and Africa and and uh, other Korea. parts of Asia mm-hmm. and Europe. So there's many different kinds. Unfortunately, the kinds that were over in China in Europe were called the hemorrhagic uh, fever and renal syndrome. They weren't the, the type that caused this lung disease. So that was very unusual when, we, when the, everyone saw these cases in 1993, this, this lung pathology and difficulty breathing. That was never found in hantaviruses before. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot different. And, uh, again, it's, um, yeah, we found it in 1993, but it's probably been in the rodents uh, for thousands of years, sure. so it's it's always been around. And and in fact, some of our cases, uh, the hundred cases we have in New Mexico, I think three or four of them were actually from before 1993. We actually went back retrospectively and had tissue samples and such that we were able to test and show that these were actually cases of hantavirus that occurred before 1993. Also, I think you know what was unique is in the Four Corners area in New Mexico, we have a really good centralized healthcare system, and so. Uh, when these cases occurred in a cluster of a, a few, two or three at the same time, people really took notice. And, and uh, I was part of the Centers for Disease Control initial investigation team that went in and, you know, got all these kind of samples and, and had them tested at, at CDC to, in order to, like you said, you know, discover. But, you know, it's been around for a long time. Sure. I am talking to New Mexico State Public Health Veterinarian, Dr. Paul Edistad, and we are discussing hantavirus. Now, hantavirus cases have been reported in about 34 states, and I know there's at least one case that's known in Florida where um, we're airing from. Right. And now the vast majority, though, however, like about 95%, uh, seem to have occurred in states west of the Mississippi. And I had you on about a year ago to talk about the plague, so this is a very similar question. Why the west? Is it something about the environmental conditions, the rodent population? I think, uh, yeah, I think that we have a very significant population of the deer mice uh, out in the West. And again, we have a lot of people who live very rural lifestyle, and that can put them in contact with a lot of uh, deer mice. Now, the case you had down in Florida, I think that was uh, um, the Black Creek Canal virus, which That's I think was caused by the uh, the rice rat or the cotton rat, I think. Yes. And, uh, and so I, I, I think that's a lot uh, rarer. What we have found when we've uh, done um, uh, trap studies and, and caught deer mice is that you can have in the West here, on an average, about 10% of the deer mice are positive for hantavirus. But what can happen, in uh, they can vary over time in geography. So you can have trap in one area and have uh, 10% of the mice positive. You can go back six months later and all of a sudden 80 to 90 percent of the mice are positive in that area. So when these things are highly variable like that, if you have people being constantly exposed when a lot of mice are positive, that's when you seem to see a cluster of cases. I see. Now let, let's go back to New Mexico for a second. Um, the health department reported two cases last week, and one was fatal, and that's what made me decide to try to contact you. Um, my question is: Is it unusual to see hantavirus uh, this time of the year? You know what we see, we and we, you know, we put our cases on cases by month to look at them, and the highest number of cases we do have are in the late spring uh, and early summer. Uh, there's a lot more rodents around at that time. There's a lot more people out doing activities that can put them in contact with rodents. But we also see a little spike in the fall, and I think what's going on there is when it gets cold, uh, the mice try to get inside people's homes. They're much more likely to try to get inside where it's warm and there's food and water. So we do see an uptake of cases in, in October, November time. Just just because of that, I think the mice are trying to, to seek shelter and water. Very good. Yeah. Um, my final question, uh, Dr. Edistad, um, hantavirus, like many viruses, um, there's no specific treatment, cure, vaccine. Um, so prevention is key. What advice do you give to the New Mexico public on preventing hantavirus? Right. You know, we try to let people know this is an extremely rare disease. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, but, to you know, you don't want to be the one person who gets it. So there are a number of things you can do to try and decrease your risk. 
I mean, the most important thing, of course, is that, you know, you need to stay away from their mice and stay away from their droppings. So people who have these animals in their home, we try to tell them, you know, look around your house. How are the mice getting in? They can get into the home in, uh, through a hole the size of a dime. So if you can um, stop up all those holes, you can stop the mice from coming into your home. Using snap traps in your home to try to get rid of the mice when they're all gone. And then any droppings or urine on the ground, try not to use a broom or a vacuum cleaner because you're just going to aerosolize that into the air. Right. Try to soak it down with a good disinfectant to start. Any disinfectant works well. If you want to make your own home disinfectant, a cup and a half of bleach to a gallon of water works really well. Soak the droppings of the urine with that for about 20 minutes and then wipe it up with a mop. That way you're not going to be aerosolizing any virus and, and anything there. You, you've already killed it also. Uh, in the in the springtime, when you're opening up a cabin or a shed, open the door and the window and just leave it open for about 30 minutes. Let it air out before you go inside. Uh, and again, don't uh, leave food or water, your pet's food or water outside uh, your home because that's going to just attract the mice closer to your home and then they might come inside your home and you're, you might be exposed that way. Well, fantastic advice. I want to thank Dr. Paul Edestad with the New Mexico Department of Health. Thank you, sir, for your time and your expertise. Thank you. I appreciate it. Bye. All right. Well, always love talking to the public health vets. They are just a encyclopedia of knowledge about some of these zoonotic infections. And later on the show in the second segment, we will be talking about another zoonotic infection uh, called tularemia. Now, I have to ask you, have you seen the video that was put out recently by the CBC News in Canada? It's concerning um, vaccines and parents taking their children to uh, certain types of health specialists. And all I can say is, wow. Now, we recognize how unfortunately pervasive the anti-vaccine movement has become here in the United States. However, we learn through this video, it's titled Vaccines, Shot of Confusion, that Canada is certainly not immune, no pun intended. Uh, it goes over some of the vaccine myths that permeate the Great White North, and we find that the source of a lot of this misinformation is homeopaths. Now, homeopathy is essentially a system of alternative medicine. It's been around for some time. But the, the, the clip is about 17 minutes, the whole video. But I want to just expose you to about two and two and a half minutes of, uh, of, the, of the video. And it explores what the parents are hearing about vaccines when they take their children to a homeopath. Uh, Joe, go ahead and play clip one. But one group goes further, homeopaths. They offer an alternative treatment to vaccination. Hi. So we book appointments with homeopaths for mums Katie and Emma. Yeah, hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. And you must be nice to meet you. Five in all in Toronto and Vancouver. Nice, nice to meet you. We want to test how vaccines are discussed and what impact that can have on parents. You're a distraction because you're so <laughs> cute. The babies settle in. And Natalie is 10 months old. Natalie is 10 months old. And it doesn't take long for almost all of the homeopaths to raise concerns about vaccines. Babies are getting too much stimulation of their immature immune systems. We see so many children, unlike when I was a child, mm. with peanut allergies, with egg allergies, with eczema. In two allergies. different appointments, Emma's told the number of shots kids get today is overwhelming their immune systems. Having, you know, 26 vaccinations by the time we were two now. We're creating a real uh, generation of sickly kids. We show vaccine expert Shannon McDonald. Is there any truth to that? It's quite the opposite, actually. So the number of vaccines are more, but we've refined vaccines to the point that the actual, um, shall we say, the germs, the antigens that are put into the child's arm are at a much lower number. Next, four out of five take a shot at a shot every kid's supposed to get, the MMR vaccine for measles, mumps, and rubella. Some kids, I think, are sensitive, and autism may be something they develop because of MMR or not. Incredibly, these homeopaths tell Emma and Katie vaccines could cause autism. There's also other vaccines 
that could cause autism, not just MMR. In one appointment, then another. I mean, I would see a lot of autistic kids, but the autistic kids I see, their parents are fairly confident that their children were vaccine damaged. Really? Yeah. Vaccine damaged? I mean, autism oh, wow. really is an epidemic at this point in time. Yeah. And, you know, all the official studies say, well, it's not related to vaccination, and yet you just can't... McDonald can't believe the autism myth based on a discredited study is alive and well. That whole study has been completely debunked, but it planted the seed of doubt in parents' minds, and it's hard to unscare people. Wow. You know, in addition to downplaying the importance of vaccines, and still pushing the vaccine autism myth, uh, the homeopaths downplayed the serious, seriousness of diseases like whooping cough and measles. If you listen to the video in your own time, you know, you'll hear one homeopath say, you know, many diseases that children are vaccinated against, their risk of getting is very low. And another one uh, will make the extraordinary claim that uh, measles is not really a dangerous disease. I mean, really? And th then you'll see another a third homeopath claim that if kids got measles over the age of one, it's actually a very fairly harmless disease. So uh, I encourage you to check that out. Uh, and finally, one of the things that uh, the CBC, um, the Canadian uh, press um, explores is this thing called, it's a vaccine alternative, uh, it's more or less a placebo like sugar pill that's supposedly made of extremely diluted disease tissue or excretion. And the homeopaths claim that the memory of the original diseases in the sugar pills can somehow create immunity. So I encourage you to go to YouTube and check out the video. It's called Vaccines Shot of Confusion and it's published by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. All right, let's get away from that topic and move on to something that I talked about a little bit a couple of weeks ago on the show, um, I was talking about the outbreak of plague in Madagascar. And, um, and basically, I, was ex I explained pretty thoroughly that uh, plague is no stranger to this island country. However, you know, as I was going through the news sources and all that, many in the media were very hyperbolic in writing about this outbreak. And I, I wrote about this in a blog post on OutbreakNewsToday.com. Uh, this one example, I, pointed, I picked out one article, and it was from the website MedCity News. And the author was uh, Nicole Oren, and she pens the following title. Quit stressing about Ebola. The bubonic plague is next. Okay. So she opens by saying, okay, Ebola has gotten the nation and the world into a total frenzy. But of course... We've got yet another thing to worry about. I mean, worry? Okay. Um, so she goes through and, and doesn't give a lot of history on what goes on in Madagascar. Just in the past couple of decades would have been plenty. I mean, and then she closes the article by saying, <clears throat> quote, we don't want to be a source of hyping up paranoia, but this is getting a little bit intense. And as I said, what uh, Ms. Ms. Oran doesn't say is that plague caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis is essentially a mainstay on the world's fourth largest island. Um, during the first decade of this century, Madagascar saw an excess of 7,000 plague cases, uh, second, in the, second in the whole world. And from 1990 to 1999, Madagascar was the plague leader. Um, and they see, you know, five, 600 cases and dozens of fatalities every year. So plague is no stranger to Madagascar. So when you're reading some of these articles, beware of the hyperbole. Um, she also makes a comparison to what is happening in the, you know, current West Africa Ebola outbreak. And that is clearly apples and oranges. And for those of us that have been writing about outbreaks and infectious disease news for years, this is something that we see every year. So I just want to keep things in perspective. Well, on Monday, the World Health Organization came out with a statement basically saying um, the same thing that I'm saying about the media coverage of the plague outbreak. 
the statement came after a flurry of media accounts that seemed to sensationalize the outbreak without taking into account the plague history in the country. Uh, the WHO says that the plague is endemic in the country with epidemic seasonal peaks ranging from September to March. So there you go. Um, the WHO backed me up. I appreciate that. <laughs> Any hockey fans out there? Well, one thing I don't typically equate with the rough and tumble world of professional hockey is childhood illness. But that's exactly what's happening in the NHL today. At least a dozen players on four NHL teams, the Minnesota Wild, Anaheim Ducks, New York Rangers, and the New Jersey Devils, have contracted the mumps this season, an unexpected outbreak that the league and the Players Association are trying to contain. Uh, the NHL Deputy Commissioner, Bill Daly, said the following, quote, It is certainly an outbreak that was unexpected and has caused unwanted disruption at the team level, but it is not something that we have any significant control over. As long as our clubs are doing what they need to do to minimize the contraction, we are hopeful that the wave of cases will run their course and life will return to normal in the relatively near term. Now, the Canadian press wrote something very uh, lucid, and they said, while 12 out of 600 players getting mumps is not a full-fledged epidemic, but the lack of familiarity with mumps has made it a talking point around the league. Uh, one of the players from the Minnesota Wild, Zach Paris, I'm not familiar with hockey players, but he told Minnesota media, what is this, the Oregon Trail? Where are we right now? Every team seems to get the flu once a year, but the mumps? And, of course, in the light of uh, the outbreak, uh, all the teams are aware and taking precautions. The Vancouver Canucks have come out, and they said they've been sending out emails to the players about signs and symptoms and warning signs, um, making sure they're vaccinated and doing whatever they can do to prevent it. Of course, mumps is a very contagious typically a childhood disease that's uh, spread by droplets of saliva or mucus from the mouth, nose, or throat. And you can also contract it by sharing soft drink cans, eating utensils. Um, mumps symptoms are kind of nonspecific. We have fever, headache, muscle aches, and tiredness. Uh, the thing that's very characteristic with mumps is the... Um, swollen sal salivary glands that are behind the ears or the jaw on either one side or the other of the face. Um, that, and you'll, you'll see that in pictures of kids with mumps. They have this big swollen jaw. Um, mumps is a pretty, pretty mild infection. However, there can be some serious complications that happen. Uh, in males, you can have inflammation of the testicles. Um, uh, you can have Inflammation of the brain, encephalitis and meningitis. These are very rare, but they can happen. In females, you can have inflammation of the ovaries or the breast. And uh, you, there can be deafness that, comes, that goes along with this. Of course, we've had a lot of problem with mumps in the United States this year. And doctors are blaming it on the waning protection from the vaccine. Um, in fact... Just in the first eight months of the year, from January to August, the CDC says there was 965 people in the U.S. reported to have mumps. And outbreaks in at least four universities, Ohio State, Fordham, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign accounted for a big chunk of this um, mumps outbreak this year. Um I want to encourage you to check out the website. It's outbreaknewstoday.com. A plethora of good news out there uh, for those that are interested in this kind of thing. And uh, if you have a topic you'd like me to discuss or get somebody on the show to discuss, email me at outbreaknews1 um, at gmail.com. And I'll see you after the break. Break news this week with Robert Harriman continues after this.
With SRN News, I'm Wally Hines in Washington. Police in Alabama say a suspect has been arrested in the shooting death of an Auburn University football player. Freshman Jaquel Mitchell was shot early today at the same off-campus apartment complex where two former football players and a third man were slain in 2012. Police say the 22-year-old suspect was arrested on a felony warrant charging him with murder. A former CIA official says the enhanced interrogation program he oversaw after 9-11 was one of the most thoroughly reviewed covert action programs in the history of the agency. Jose Rodriguez tells Fox News Sunday the Senate Intelligence Committee's report on the program throws the CIA under the bus. The power coming back for more people in Vermont. Utilities say just under 4,000 homes and businesses are now without electricity. More details at srnnews.com. Intelligent Talk with Dennis Prager. Why does change excite the left? Because it gives them meaning. There is more to do. Everybody believes that there is more to do in improving the world, but they're transforming the world. That's what the left stands for. So Obamacare is just one part of a long journey. 860WGUL.com. Today, there is a way for you to know if a government snooping program is on your PC right now. I'm Digital Pro Kim Commando. More coming up. Tablets are so incredibly useful, from emailing, shopping, reading books, watching movies, photo sharing, posting to Facebook, and making video calls with loved ones. That's why I created the custom-built Commando Tab with what's most important to you in a tablet. Easy to use, great size, and a fantastic price. My limited-edition Commando Tab tablet features a vibrant, bright 10.1-inch touchscreen, front and rear cameras, USB port, SD card reader, all powered by a blazing fast processor with 16 gigabytes of storage. It really does have all the bells and whistles. Now, for a limited time only, order your Commando Tab bundle. It includes my Commando Tab tablet, wireless keyboard, and protective case for an amazing price of under $230, a $50 savings. If you order the Commando Tab bundle today, you'll get it in time for the holidays. It makes a great gift for you or a loved one. Order yours right now at getkim.com. That's GetKim.com. We know that the NSA, FBI, DEA, and other agencies can snoop on our phone calls, location, social media posts, and other potentially sensitive information with very little effort. Government-grade malware is an entirely different story. These viruses are built to target specific computers, read personal email, listen in on private calls, record every single keystroke made on the computer, remotely watch someone through a computer's camera, or even turn on the microphone. There are two military-grade tools that have been found on the computers of journalists, human rights workers, researchers, and normal folks, too. But there is a free program called Detect that can find them on your computer. The makers claim they built it to, quote-unquote, raise awareness. And it's free. You can find it today on my website, along with all the breaking tech news updated all the time, at commando.com. That's K-O-M-A-N-D-O. Sunshine in your forecast for this afternoon and a high today of 69. Then tonight, mainly clear conditions, low 46. Tomorrow should be pleasant. A full day of sunshine, high 70. Tomorrow evening, clear, low 50. Tuesday, sunny skies, high 72. Wednesday, mainly sunny, another nice day with a high of 72. That's your AccuWeather forecast. I'm Sarah Lauer for Talk Radio 860 WGUL. Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Welcome back to the show. Uh, We have some news that come out of New York State today. Um, They declared um, the state to be influenza prevalent. Well, what does that mean? The, the acting New York State Health Commissioner um, said that now, with this declaration, health care workers who are not vaccinated against influenza have to wear masks in areas where patients are typically uh, present. So we're seeing that in New York State. We may be seeing that in some other states, too. All right. Now, like hantavirus, which we discussed in the first segment, Tularemia is a zoonotic infection, and that's basically a term which means that it's an infection that originates in animals and it gets transmitted to humans. 
Now, the state of Colorado has seen a significant increase in human tularemia infections this year. In fact, officials say they've seen a five-fold increase this year as compared to the average um, annual numbers. Here to talk about tularemia and the situation in Colorado is Dr. Jennifer House. Dr. House is the state public health veterinarian for the Colorado Department of Health. Good evening, Dr. House, and thanks for talking to me today. Hi. Okay, well, on my website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, I've been keeping a pretty close eye on Colorado this year. You've had a lot of activity going on, and um, I've seen, you know, several cases of human plague and a number of cases of human tularemia, and that's where I want to focus our attention on. Um, Can we first start, though, with a discussion on an overview of tularemia or rabbit fever for my radio audience? Yes, um, tularemia is a um, it's a disease that's caused by bacteria that's found in the environment, and um, the bacteria is Francisella tularaniasis, um, and it is often referred to as rabbit fever because it does make rabbits sick. So we, you will see um, die offs of rabbits in association with this particular bacteria. But it doesn't just make rabbits and people sick. It makes lots of other um, uh, mammal animal, animals sick, um, such as uh, squirrels, moles, mice, beavers, um, uh, sheep, cats, dogs. Lots of animals are actually very susceptible to this bacteria. Um, Now, there's a number of ways people can get infected with tularemia. Uh, Can you discuss that? Yes, of course. Um, and so um, there are different ways. So it is um, carried in animals, but it's also in the soil and in water. Um, so individuals can be exposed in a number of different ways from actually um, a, a handling an animal that is um, has died or is dying from tularemia. They can actually get it from handling those animals. They can get it from um, breathing it in if it's been aerosolized in the air. They can get it from soil contamination that gets in a wound, such as if they cut themselves while gardening. They can get it from a tick or a fly bite. Um, They can actually, if they um, consume undercooked meat of an animal that had it, they can get it that way. Um, They can drink it if it's in contaminated water. So um, it can be um, acquired in lots of different ways. Right. And... The and I even I even uh, covered one story in Colorado where some gentleman uh, contracted it mowing the lawn. Um, I, um, historically, there have been lots of cases where individuals have actually gotten it if they mow in an area where there has been a die off of animals. Mm-hmm. Um, it could could be rabbits or it could be other animals. If they mow in that area, so if they mow over a dead rabbit, that would be one way. But even if there's just been animals in the area and it's in the soil, uh-huh. when when you mow, you actually stir up the dirt. So you can actually inhale it that way and get what we call the pneumonic form. And that is the most severe form of the disease if you get it that way. Right. And, th- and that kind of leads me into my next question. Uh, the signs and symptoms of tularemia vary depending on how the bacteria enters the body. It could be a... Um, localized skin ulcer, uh, all the way to the most severe form of pneumonic. Um, I guess my question is, with all these cases of tularemia, is there a trend? Is there a, a transmission form that's been predominant? Um, there has, yes. Um, so it can actually be very complicated to diagnose because the the actual clinical symptoms that you get is going to depend on how the bacteria enters your body. Um, the most common form is what we call ulceroglandular, and that is um, often when it's either in soil or a bug bite. So you get an ulcer, and then you get swelling in your lymph node, which is what we mean when we say glandular. So most cases this year have um, been glandular in some form. Some have had an ulcer and some have not had an ulcer. But then we have had other forms this year, including the pneumonic, which means it was inhaled. We've seen gastrointestinal. And then we've had another form called typhoidal, which means that it's in the bloodstream. Mm. So we've actually, um, it's the most common form we've seen this year has been glandular, but we've seen all the other forms also. Interesting. Now, in the last decade, um, nearly all the states in the Union have seen some cases of human tularemia. And uh, I think the CDC said the total was about uh, 1,200 cases. 
Now, I was looking at the CDC stats for tularemia for Colorado from 2004 to 2013, and your state reported 27 human, human tularemia cases, or about three a year. Now, to date this year, Colorado has seen 15 human cases, so about five times the average, and 11 required hospitalization. Dr. House, can you explain the significant increase this year? What's different, uh, environment, ecology? Okay, um, so um, yes, in the past 10 years, we've had between uh, one to three cases a year. Um, but if you actually go back further and look historically at our records, um, uh, like uh, the last time we've seen this many cases was actually in the early 80s. So if you go back further in history, you know, our numbers are not unprecedented. It, ha it has happened okay. before. And then if you keep going back towards the 60s and the 50s, you can see that. So it has been a cyclical disease where we have certain spikes, and then it will go back down to our what we call baseline levels, and then it spikes again. So um, we have had a spike this year that is most likely related to the um, large number of animals that we've had. We have had a lot of um, uh, small um, uh, small mammals, such as rabbits, um, this year. Um, and then um, with the increased animal density, if you get one that gets it, then it's more likely they're going to spread it to each other, and then you're going to have die-offs. And the more die-offs that there are, the more of the bacteria you see in the environment. And that's what we're seeing this year. We've had a number of animal die-offs throughout the state. Very good. And that kind of led me into my next question about I, I noticed that at least 27 counties in um, Colorado have seen animal tularemia. And you pretty much answered it, yes, it's a little bit higher than normal, the prevalence. Am I correct? Yes. Um, we have had die-offs that um, could be attributed to tularemia in at least 30 counties. And um, we've been able to confirm that in uh, most of those counties, but not all of them. And that just has to do with um, are we able to get in an animal sample that's of sufficient quality to do correct testing. Right. Um, but we have had reported die-offs from at least 30 counties. Okay. I am talking to Dr. Jennifer House. Uh, she's the Colorado State Public Health Veterinarian, and we're talking tularemia or rabbit fever. And I just want to close with this question, uh, Dr. House. Um, with this increase, uh, what are you telling the Colorado public uh, concerning the prevention of this bacterial disease? And we have been trying to get prevention messages out there because we now know this bacteria is very prevalent in our environment and people are at risk. So we ask people to take um, precautions um, not to handle dead animals. If they see a, a, um, a die-off of mammals, they should call their local health department and report that die-off. Um, they should wear insect repellent if they're going to be out in areas where they could be bitten by a tick or a fly. And if an individual does develop a, a fever that they can't explain, they should see their doctor and let their doctor know if they have been in an area, if they've been just doing recreation in an outside area or mowing. Well, very good. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Jennifer House, for your time and expertise. I appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me on the show today. You bet. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye. All right. So we've looked at a couple of animal-borne um, infections that are transmitted to humans, and we're seeing, we see a lot of these infections out west. Um, so, however, that doesn't mean we can't see tularemia here in Florida. There are cases. Now, let's switch gears. Um, I saw on Time Magazine, um, they uh, selected their person of the year. Now, I saw... You know, they had a handful of finalists ranging from Vladimir Putin to um, Taylor Swift to uh, the, the people that are rioting in Ferguson, Missouri. However, I believe this year Time Magazine got it right, and they put on their cover the Ebola fighters. Um, these are the doctors, the nurses, and the other um, professionals and volunteers uh, that have been fighting Ebola, and uh, congratulations to them. Um, let me. I'm going to go ahead and play a little clip of what Time Magazine Deputy Managing Editor Radhika Jones.
had to say about the cover. Go ahead, Joe. We really wanted to draw attention to the people who, from the very beginning, when they were being ignored um, by many bureaucrats and, and government officials, decided this is this is a potential danger. It's a potential danger not just to our communities but to the world, and we are going to do what we can to prepare and fight it on the ground. One of the, the amazing stories of, that we feature is that of Dr. Jerry Brown, uh, who is a Liberian surgeon. He is the man on our cover. And he, very early on when he started hearing reports about this disease um, rearing up, uh, he became very afraid that it might, that the way he put it in an interview is that it might wipe his country off the map. So um, congratulations for uh, a job well done for the Ebola fighters and for Time Magazine, who I think got it right this year. All right. Now, we had some pretty big news come uh, out from the uh, Food and Drug Administration on Wednesday, and they announced uh, the approval of Gardasil 9. Uh, Gardasil 9 is the new HPV, human papillomavirus vaccine, um, which prevents diseases caused by up to nine different types of HPV. Um, This is five more HPV types than the previous Gardasil um, covered. So Gardasil 9, according to the FDA, has the potential to prevent uh, about 90% of cervical, vulvar, v- vaginal, and anal cancers. So um, a little bit of information on the vaccine itself. It's approved for use in females ages 9 through 26 and males ages 9 through 15. And like I said, it's, it's approved for a whole slew, nine different types of a- HPV types. Some are the cancer-causing ones, and there's a couple of them that are known to cause genital warts. Um, uh, Karen Midthun, Dr. Karen Midthun, she's the director of the FDA Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, said the following, vaccination is a critical public health measure for lowering the risk of most cervical, genital, and anal cancers caused by HPV. The approval of Gardasil 9 provides broader protection against HPV-related cancers. Um, So the Gardasil 9 will be administered in three separate shots with the initial dose followed by additional shots given at two and six months. Now, the safety studies of Gardasil 9 were evaluated in about uh, 13,000 males and females, and the most common reported adverse reactions were injection site pain, swelling, redness, and headaches. All right, well, let's go ahead and do a little flu update. I talked about what's happening in New York, and uh, uh, they uh, jacked up the uh, preparedness up there, and now they got healthcare workers that are not vaccinated wearing masks. And here's a flu update from Passport Health. And influenza is spreading at its most rapid pace of the season. Uh, A couple regions of the country, the southeast, where we are right now in Florida, and the northwest, um, Oregon, Washington, that area, remain the most affected areas with the most cases and the highest positive tested specimen percentage, respectively. Uh, CDC says that flu cases have nearly doubled from last week, and that may only be the start. Of course, we know... We talked about last week how um, the one of the components of the flu vaccine is not going to be that. It's only going to be about 50% effective this year because of uh, some antigenic drift with the H3N2. So got to keep an eye on that. Flu is here and flu is here hard in Florida right now. Um, Got some... Uh, Got some good news on the malaria front. Um, However, with some caveats, just like everything else. The World Health Organization told us in the World Malaria Report 2014 that just came out that people dying from malaria has fallen dramatically since 2000. And malaria cases have also steadily declined. 
So between 2000 and 2013, malaria mortality rate decreased by 47% worldwide and possibly more significantly, 54% in Africa. And that's where about 90% of all malaria deaths occur. So that's, that's huge. Um, some new analysis from sub-Sahara Africa reveals that uh, despite a, a large population increase, about 43%, fewer people are infected or carry asymptomatic malaria infections every year. So the number of people infected fell um, from about 173 million, imagine that, 173 million in 2000 to about 128 million in 2013. Still sounds like two pretty large numbers. However, uh, that's about a 50 million uh, person uh, difference. Now, their achievements have are uh, largely due to scaled up activities and um, increases of u- use of in insecticide-treated bed nets, uh, better testing, better diagnostics. Uh, the World Health Organization also says that you know, hundreds of millions of courses of art, artemisin-based combination therapies, this is the primo malaria drug right now, um, has gone up dramatically from about 11 million 10 years ago to nearly 400 million courses uh, today. However, the caveats, uh, there's many challenges that remain um, Africa has seen some insecticide resistance. It's been report not just Africa, but around the world. About 49 countries around the world are seeing some resistance to insecticide for the Anopheles mosquito. And that's incredibly important as it's a key component of the vector control. Um, and as far as the treatment, resistance to the ACT, what I discussed in the last uh, few seconds, Uh, has been detected in five countries in the greater Mekong subregion. So Cambodia and Thailand and that area, they're starting to see resistance. So that that is a major, major issue. Now, the Ebola-affected countries. Now, at particular risk is the progress on malaria in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. Um, What this outbreak, this Ebola outbreak has caused has been a devastating impact on malaria treatment and the rollout of malaria interventions. Um, The majority of um, health facilities remain closed in these three countries. Uh, Attendance in outpatient facilities is down to a small fraction compared to prior to the outbreak. Now, given the intense malaria transmission in these three countries, which saw, get this, 6.6 million malaria cases and 20,000 malaria deaths last year, um, the World Health Organization is issuing new guidance on temporary measures to control the disease during the Ebola outbreak, providing the drugs to all fever patients, even if they haven't been tested for malaria, and carrying out mass anti-malaria drug administration uh, to the affected areas. So, you know, and I had this kind of, I had this discussion on uh, the beginning of November with uh, uh, Dr. Tara Smith, and one of the outcomes of this Ebola outbreak is the hospitals and all the healthcare and everything is just enveloped around Ebola. What's happening to malaria? What's happening to diarrheal diseases? What's happening to prenatal care? Well, the World Health Organization at least appears to be trying to address the issue of malaria. And did I see an interesting story? Live Science published a story Wednesday, and I want to share it with you, about the dangers of giving birth in a birthing pool. Well, apparently... An infant in Texas died from Legionnaire's disease a few weeks after being born in a heated birthing pool at home, according to a new report from investigators at the Texas Department of Health. Of course, Legionnaire's disease is a very severe form of uh, pneumonia 
caused by the Legionella bacteria. And this bacteria lives normally in warm water and can be found in hot tubs and plumbing systems. Now the baby's death, which occurred um, this past January, is the first and only documented case of this infection with water birth in the United States. And it comes after a few similar cases that were seen in Europe. Now, um, the uh, epidemiologist with the Texas Health Department um, and one of the co-authors of the study, Elise Fritschel, said the following, they, meaning the babies, are at a higher risk category because of their underdeveloped immune system and their developing physiology. Well, the, the story goes that the six-day-old infant was taken to the hospital with breathing problems and other signs of infection. The doctors tested for some more common bacteria, but they also suspected the infant might have Legionnaire's disease because the infant was exposed to heated water. Tests showed that the infant was indeed infected with Legionella, and after a 19-day hospitalization, the baby died. Um, the American Academy of, of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists said the following, giving birth in water is generally not recommended because there are no proven benefits and there are potential risks to the baby. So fascinating story. I, I personally didn't cover it, but it was covered on live science. So, uh, it'd be something worth checking out. Okay, we're getting close to the end of the show. I want to encourage you to check out the website, outbreaknewstoday.com. Um, some of the headlines we have going on right now um, concerning the Ebola outbreak, Sierra Leone reports three times the cases as Guinea and Liberia combined. Um, two more farms in British Columbia, Canada um, are infected with the H5N2 avian influenza. Um, French Polynesia reported about 9,000 chikungunya cases during the past week, and there's just so, so much more. So check out the website, outbreaknewstoday.com. Um, the company also has a sister website. It's called theglobaldispatch.com, and you can go there for all kinds of news, um, pop culture news, uh, political news, and uh, local type of news. And if you... Like I said before earlier in the show, if you want me to go over a particular topic or get a particular guest, if there's somebody you like to hear speak, contact me, outbreaknews1 at gmail.com. Okay, and uh, I want to thank Joe for running the show. He did a fantastic job today. And I will see you next week for more of the world of infectious diseases. Have a great weekend. Thank you for listening to Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. If you missed any part of today's program, you can listen to the podcast anytime on our website, talkradio860.com. You can also find out more at outbreaknewstoday.com. Make sure to join us here next week at 5 for Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman on Talk Radio 860, WGUL.